Amen. Good afternoon. Whippersnapper. The young whippersnapper. <laughs> Good afternoon, brother. Ooh, we got a, we got something. We got something today. We got something today. Uh, today is Thursday. Uh, the weather is beautiful, and we got a beautiful question that we are going to address. A beautiful question. A question that is not a novice question. What? Listen. I am a proponent of the one of the the question that is not asked is the stupidest one, right? However, in time, brother, with time, you will be able to discern between people who are asking questions who want to know truth as opposed to those that are asking questions to justify themselves and or are foolish questions just wanting to keep a mill going. Okay, with time, brother, you will be able to discern the difference. Um, you know, I, I've encountered many, many questions, many. Uh, unfortunately, a majority of them nowadays are those coming from those who do not want to hear the truth. And when you answer the question, what they do is they take it back repackage the same question in a different way and then put it to you in a different fashion but asking the same question. It's like, dude, I already answered that. Okay? That is someone who doesn't want to seek truth but wants to seek justification and also to trip up the one who is trying to answer the question. In time, all of you will be able to learn how to discern that. Okay? And a novice question is not a, nothing wrong with a novice question. What is a novice question? Simple. Why did Paul and Jesus seemingly preach two different things? Okay. And why do I call that a novice question? Because we are commanded in Scripture. Please get your authorized version of Scripture. Read along with me. Read along with me. I make mistakes, so read along with me. Read along with me. You need to see what we're going, what we're looking at today, especially today. Okay, so read along with me. But in Second uh, Timothy chapter three, Second Timothy chapter three, uh, Second Timothy chapter two, here is a commandment for us today. Verse fifteen: Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. It is a novice question when someone asks you, well, why did Jesus preach one thing and Paul preached something different? Obviously, people like stupid head Christy Burke notice that. Uh, eighth, self-theist Dade Murphy uh, noticed that. That nut job Aaron Ra noticed that. Okay, And several other. A lot of Christians will notice that. It's like, well, Jesus preached something totally different. And, but Paul preached something, and they seem to contradict, don't they? Also with James, which, you know, which a lot of you... Stay away from Christians, okay? Stay away from Christians, especially those who do not rightly divide the word of truth, okay? They go to James, and they try to blend it together for today when the book of James is written unto the twelve tribes of Israel for the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? It's a Jake, time of Jacob's trouble epistle, the book of James, okay? All right? But rightly dividing the word of truth, salvation changes within the dispensation. You got these insane, evil, free grace people who say rightly divide. They will throw out the term rightly divide. But yet, salvation is to them by grace through faith from the Garden of Eden Onto even the kingdom of heaven. And it is obvious that it is not. Okay? Salvation, the way a man is made right, changes within this dispensation. You are not made right the way you are today as you were in the Garden of Eden. As in the patriarchal period, 
which is similar to today's dispensation, but ultimately no uh, seal of the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit, and the death, burial, and resurrection hadn't happened yet, and they were not looking forward to the cross in the Old Testament. They were not. If they were, Peter wouldn't have said what he said. Okay? <laughs> okay? All right? It, it's, they were not looking forward to the cross. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That is a basic nuts and bolts foundational teaching, uh, doctrine, uh, whatever you want to call it. That is a necessity to even to begin to comprehend the word of truth and the spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth. The Lord is that spirit, okay? Saints saved people. Not all of them, unfortunately. But saints saved people are aware of rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth is a necessity. Study this issue thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's a command. It's not, well, if you feel like it. Hey, you don't have, no. Because if you don't, and you say that it's by grace through faith from the Garden of Eden into the kingdom of heaven, that's, God's ashamed of you. That's nonsense. That's idiocy. And you Christians, probably nine out of ten of you, are not taught to rightly divide the word of truth. And when you hear rightly divide the word of truth, like say from a free gracer, they teach you that his grace is what changes. His grace is there constantly or else we'd all go up like a puff of smoke. A way, the way man is made right and or saved is what changes. That is a foundational, basic, basic milk thing. It's milk. But see, unto you Christians who believe and receive, God loves you unconditionally, and the nonsense that you get from garbage that you watch on television, to you, when a saint comes to you saying, you got to rightly divide the word of truth, and you say, well, salvation changes within the dispensation, you look at them as if they just farted in your general direction. Okay? Why is that? Because there's a famine in the land of hearing of the words of God. So, in reality, it is a novice question. It is. I mean, it really is, because... Study the shoe thyself approved unto God, uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Okay, that is a great example of a novice question. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. There's nothing. Christianity is not being taught to rightly divide the word of truth. And when they hear of it, they're being taught wrongly, well, his grace is what, no. No. Okay? No. The question that was asked publicly uh, is not a novice question. And the question itself, which was asked by my best friend, dear beloved brother, um, the question itself, we are, we're, obviously this is what this video is about. We, you, I, this cannot be passed up. And this is a question that should be shared with you, the body of Christ. This is not milk today. This is meat, okay? This question comes from a dearly beloved who has a gift to notice the smaller things that most people wouldn't. God bless, Godspeed, brother. God bless you. So, to lead into this, what does it mean to die? Seriously, what does it mean to die? What does it mean to be dead? What is death? Seriously. Now, that might be milk in, in theory and practice, but what does it mean scripturally? Okay? We, brother, we, we have to go through this process. Okay? We have to establish these things. Okay? All right? So let's go. I'm excited about this. I really am. First, now, the very first appearance of any connotation of death, dying, dead, of any kind of 
whatever of whatever it is appears in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to look at that last and then we're going to lead into the actual question. But we're going to begin, what does it mean to be dead? Dead, okay? What does it mean to be dead? Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. We are going to be reading verses 1 on to verse 7. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister. This is before what was written in Leviticus. Even at this time, the gene pool was a lot purer than anything it is today, even after the flood, okay? Uh, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. And God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, uh, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. Look who said that first. This is the first appearance of the word dead. Okay? Who is the first one to mention the word dead? For, check, please, look for yourself. The very first appearance of the word dead. Right here. Who is saying it first? But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, he was in a, this was in his dream, okay? God said to him, You're a dead man. Question. Was Abimelech physically dead? It says here that he came to him in a dream at night. Do dead people dream? Uh, dead in trespasses and sins. Yeah. But physical death. Do physically dead people dream? We're, we're going we're gonna to look at that before we get into the meat of this thing. Okay? We're going to look at that. So, was Abimelech spiritually dead? Let's keep reading and find the answer. But Abimelech had not come near her, laid with her, okay? And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? Abimelech didn't know that Sarah was his wife. Abraham said, he lied. Well, kind of, because he'll say, well, she is my sister, but, you know, a half-sister thing. Okay. But, okay, that, that's legit there. That's what Abraham says. Okay. But the thing is, Abimelech did not know. He didn't know that Sarah was his wife. He said, this is my sister. He didn't say, this is my wife. Because why? Well, let's keep reading. Okay. Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself, has said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and in innocency of my hands, have I done this? What, another thing about this that's interesting is, this is before the giving of the law. How did Abimelech have enough sense to know that it was not a good thing to perhaps lay with another man's wife. I'll let you figure that one out. Okay? Look at verse 6. And he's like, will you slay a righteous nation? He didn't know. And in this time, it's like, hey, look at that woman. Like, Come here, you're mine. <laughs> and God said, verse 6, And God said unto him, in a dream. Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. See, this time, 
and you know, just read it. Abimelech's like, hey, come on, babe, you're mine. He didn't know. Abraham should have, this is my wife. Abimelech, who in the integrity of his heart, what does God say? In the integrity of thine of thy heart. So God is saying Abimelech had at least a morsel of integrity, and Abimelech himself said, Wilt thou slay a righteous a righteous nation? Okay? Keep that in mind. Question. Thou art but a dead man. Did Abimelech die because of this? Physically? No. Was he dead spiritually? Integrity of his heart, a righteous nation, before the giving, the actual writing of the law being given, but yet written on man's hearts. How did Abimelech know enough, have enough sense to not lie with another man's right, uh, wife if the laws weren't already written on man's heart? Meaning that there's, where do you, like self theists, get your morals from? How do you instinctively know that, hey, to kill something, like a, to kill another man, isn't necessarily a good thing, no matter how you want to justify it? How do you instinctively know that it's not a good thing to lay with somebody else's wife or husband, vice versa? Woman, how do you know that? I'll let you figure that one out yourself, okay? But question. Was Abimelech physically dead? No. Was he spiritually dead? In this context, what is God saying? God is saying, you're a dead man. Have you ever been threatened? It's like, you're a dead man. Meaning like most of the times when nowadays people say that, I'm going to kick your rear end. You're a dead man. You're a dead man. And look at the, keep reading. And God said, on, verse 6, And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Okay? Because even back then, before the giving of the law, Abimelech had enough sense. Why? You figure that one out. To not lay with another man's wife. If he did... He was going to be in big trouble. Okay? Verse 7. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. And incidentally too, check this on your own time, that is the very first appearance of the word prophet. Uh, uh, Genesis 20 is loaded with instruction and righteousness for us. Loaded. Okay? But that is the very first appearance of the word prophet. Prophet. Okay? And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die. Hit, brother. No, see that? Thou shalt surely die. Hinge that. Hinge, to get, to, to get, your, get your thing. Note that. Verse 7. Okay, verse 7. Note that phrase. Thou shalt surely die, and not surely temple. And all that are thine. Question. Is he referring unto a spiritual death? No, obviously. You're a dead man. God was threatening him. God threatened him. And verse 7. wasn't a threat. Actually, you could say. Because if Abimelech didn't do this, now therefore restore the man his wife. Okay? An element for work, by the way. For he is a prophet. And he shall pray for thee. And thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, Know thou that thou shalt surely die. Okay? Thou shalt surely die. And all that are thine. Question, is that a spiritual death? No, that's a physical death. Come on. Come on. 
uh, it was a righteous nation, verse 4, and God noted what his, the integrity of his heart. So was it a spiritual death? No. It was a physical death. After the Garden of Eden, yes, don't get ahead of me. Okay? Now, in Genesis, uh, what is it? In Genesis chapter 23, I have marked here. Oh, yes. Genesis chapter 23. We're going to look at another thing of what it is to die. Okay? Die. Dead. All right? And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died, obviously a physical death, obviously. In Kirjath Arba, the same is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Okay? And Abraham stood up from before his dead. Dead, the dead body of his wife. Okay, there is a physical dead, and there are those who are dead in trespasses and sins. Okay, there are, yes, yes, dead can be used two ways. The individual that we spake about on Monday, he's dead in trespasses and sins. You can tell by his eyes, okay? Oh, this is obviously, obviously, we, we, we have to go through this process. You ask. So we're doing it. So this is obviously physically dead. Okay, let's continue. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Dead body of his wife, obviously. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my lord. Thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth, and communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. Now, the guys wanted to give it just here, take it. But Abraham was insistent upon paying for it. Why? Because what happened? Okay, someone could give you something, but sooner or later they could like, well, change their mind and renege. It's like, well, you gave that to me. Well, I know I, what I did, but I'm taking it back. Le legally, he buys it, witnesses, it's like, okay, it has officially changed hands over and above word of mouth. Now, integrity and honor aside, when you have the evidences of a physical financial per, uh, purchase weighed in the thing of witnesses, that's that's a different thing. Because see, if I give, like say here, give this, I give this to you. And then after a while, because remember, we're not God, uh, it's like, you know, I gave that to you a while ago, I want it back. But you gave that to me. I Look, I know, but things change. I want it back. I want that back. Hey, I bought that from you. At a very exorbitant price, I might add. And there were a lot of witnesses. That's legit. This is mine. If you're going to try to take it back from me by force, the wrong is on you. See? See? So this is why Abraham was doing that. Let's continue. And Ephron, verse 10. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth. And plus two... Plus two, Ephron could, if he, if Abraham would have just, oh, thanks, dude, thank you. Ephron could have been like, now you owe me something. Oh, no man anything? Okay, that's another thing that you can put into this. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth. 
And he frowned the Hittite, answered Abraham, in the audience of the children of Heth, even all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my lord, hear me. The field I give thee. He's like, here, take it. I personally don't doubt Ephraim's integrity. I really don't. I, I think he was like, dude, take it. Take it. And it's like, oh, oh I, and I believe that Ephraim, even though he was not, I don't think he had any ulterior motive. That's a moot point to the uh, muse upon. But there again, when it came to the thing of the money, he's like, oh, well, okay, if you're going to give me some money for it, shoot for, the, <laughs> shoot for the sky. Let's continue. Nay, my lord, hear me. Field give I thee, and the cave that is, in, that is therein. I give it thee in the presence of all the sons of my people. Give I it thee. Bury thy dead. And also a thing that you can equate that he was trying to maybe look good in front of his people. Okay? And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land and spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth four hundred shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury, therefore, thy dead. It's like, okay, you're going to give me some. That, that's a lot. That, especially at this, this time, 400 shekels, that's quite a bit. That's quite a bit. What is that between me and thee? They, they're a couple, you know, they were, at this time, very wealthy. Okay? Remember, it was more than just tangible, too. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephraim. And Abraham weighed to Ephraim the silver which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. And we'll stop right there. Okay? And notice how it was pointed out that it was done in, in front of witnesses for many reasons that we have said. Okay? But we looked at this for death and dying. Dead and dying. Okay? Okay, because where it said uh, that Sarah died. Physical death. Dead. Physically dead. Okay? Now, go back to Genesis chapter 21. Very first appearance of the word death. Very first appearance of the word dead. And from thence comes deadly, whatever, uh, whatever, that kind of stuff. Very first appearance, singular, of dead is Genesis 20, verse 1 on to verse 7. And who was the first one to mention the word dead? It was God. Okay? Now, and for dead, for dead, first mention, was it a spiritual being dead? No. Was it a threat to being, I'm going to kill y'all? Yes. Physical death. Physical death. Genesis 21, 9 on to 21. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let, not, let it not be grievous in, the sight, in thy sight because of the lad. And because of thy bondwoman, and all that Sarah hath, and all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And of course, the sons of Ishmael, the Muslim, they say because Isaac or um, Ishmael was the firstborn, they claim they hold to the right of the firstborn. Okay, that's one of the arguments of Islam that Ishmael was the firstborn of Abraham. They're right. They're, they're right. But the children of the promise, Isaac, are the children of the seed. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Isaac, the child of promise. Not Ishmael, the child of force. Force, you're right. Uh, Abraham did not force, forcibly lay with Hagar. 
But God promised, and Abraham, at the behest of Sarah, his wife, wanted to bring about God's promises in their own means. Oh, just believe and receive, huh? <laughs> All right? That's what that's about. But it's in Isaac, the son of promise, not the son of Ish, you know, Ishmael, who was brought about by man doing it. Okay? You, you get it? And also of the son of the bondwoman, will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. That, when a, uh, when a son of Ishmael and a Muslim says about that of Abraham, you cannot, it's right there. It's right there. And Islam is the product of the Roman Catholic Church, but the sons of Ishmael are the ones that are ingratiated into Islam. Okay? All right? And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder. And the child and the child and she and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went, now pay attention, pay attention. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Hagar said, let me not see the death of the child. There's the very first appearance of the word death. First mention, death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. Death of the child. And this is not in sarcasm. This was, this was a serious question. We're treating it seriously. Question. What kind of death is this? It's obvious, isn't it? But like I said, we were addressing this seriously. Is this a spiritual death? No. It's an actual physical death. Obviously, right? It's the first appearance of death in the scriptures. Okay? All right? <clears throat> and who said it? Interesting. One. Don't, don't miss that. Don't miss that. Okay? Don't miss that. Okay? Let's continue. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Rise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make of make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes. Who opened her eyes? You'll see this coming up a little later. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew, and dwelt in the wilderness, and became an archer. Bosha, archer. Hmm. Coincidence? I think perhaps maybe. No. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Ham, Canaan. Canaan. Okay? All right? So the very first appearance of the word death is obviously speaking of a physical death. There is also a spiritual death. There is, which we are going to see demonstrated. Okay? We're going to see that demonstrated. And in the context that we will be eventually looking at in Genesis chapter 2, and in also Genesis chapter 3, we're going to read that whole chapter, um, you're going to see that the one encompasses the other in the context thereof. Okay? All right? Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Now, this is the very first appearance of any connotation. Any connotation Death, dying, whatever. Okay? Now, Genesis 2, verses 15 on to verse 17. All right? Notice 
who says it? Okay. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. You have all this you can choose from. Go, go, knock yourself out. But, now pay attention. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, knowledge of good and evil, knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Remember I told you to hinge Genesis 20? Did you do that? Genesis 20, verse 7. Okay, now, now here, 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 uh, in Genesis 20 and uh, Genesis 3, do one of these things. If you have another set of scriptures, the two-fisted approach, this would be a day to do that for this verse. Genesis 2, 17 again. But of the tree of the knowledge, knowing, knowledge, brains, knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What is the opposite of life? To live. Genesis 2 verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. What's the opposite of die? And not D-Y-E like in color. To die. What's the opposite of it? What's the opposite of, what's the opposite of dying? Living. Okay? Is, is that, come on. That, that, come on. That's, that's obvious, right? Who was the one now? You can, we can surmise for hours. What was God talking about here? Was he making a reference onto a spiritual death? Remembering that man was originally intended, created to be immortal. Yes, he was. We're going to prove that. Okay, with Genesis chapter 3. Okay, yes he was. Okay? But regardless of, I think more that it was meant in the spiritual, but the wages of sin is what? Death. Haven't you figured it out that um, a spiritual death will, can ultimately lead onto a physical death? What about you people who are out there fornicating or being uh, laying with other people who are not your wife or are being sodomites, huh? The wages of sin is death, huh? You're dead in trespasses and sins. Hmm? Think about it. But regardless of, regardless of whether he meant but I, and I think that really encompasses both because the spiritual led onto the death of the physical. But we're also going to see that physical death precedes spiritual. We'll, we'll check that out after the Garden of Eden, of course. But regardless of that, what is opposite of dying? So, the concept of not living was introduced by who? Come on. Who? who? What's the opposite of that? To die. What is the opposite to die? Look at verse 17 again. But of the tree of the knowledge of, the good, uh, of good and evil, see... I think in verse 17, yes, yes, he's referencing spiritual. Yes, I do believe that. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But see, the actual question itself was, how do you know that Satan was tempting Eve with, uh, talking about the physical death? Well, and he was. We'll, we'll, we'll see this, okay? But uh, keep reading. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 20, verse 7. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. Yes, this is after the garden. But pay attention to the phraseology. For he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and not that thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Verse 17, Genesis 2, that thou, um, thou shalt surely die, thou shalt surely die. Don't miss that. Don't miss that, brother. Don't miss that one. Don't miss that one. The one led on to the other. But see, Satan's temptation was aimed at the physical. Okay? All right? What God meant, I think he was meaning yes, the spirit. I do. But see, the what is the opposite of to die? Not to die. Live. So the idea that there would be something that would cause you not to live was introduced. That idea was introduced. You can't get you you ain't getting away from that man. You can't. You can't. It was introduced by God. But now you might be saying, oh, God brought death. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. First Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Scripture is plain on this. God made man aware. Yes, he did. Just saw it. God made, aware, made man aware of this concept, at least, of not living, which is to die. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15. 20 and 21. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 under verse 21. But now is Christ risen? Uh, wait, 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 wait uh, verses, uh, what did I write down here? Hold on. Uh, 21 on to verse 22. For since by man came death, But by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. Now, you could say twofold, spiritual and physical. But see, man, because of the fall, is born spiritually, dead in trespasses and sins. Okay? Okay? Uh, the, the kids, the babes, the kids, the kiddos, rugrats are innocent until they become aware of the enormity, the implication of what it is to have sinned against God, okay? All right? But what is Paul obviously talking about? Okay? We're all born sinners. Okay, a little rugrat. Who doesn't, you know, the age of accountability. And, here, and, you know, it does not specifically say the age of accountability. But it is greatly suggested. Nor does it say, the Lord said, I am God. Didn't need to. He said, I am. Nor does it say that Jesus said, I am the Messiah. Didn't say that. He didn't need to. It's like, he who talketh to thee am he. Okay? All right? No, it does not say in Scripture, you will physically die. No, it doesn't. But as we're going to see, what Satan aimed his temptation at was not at the spiritual, because what was Satan offering to Eve? Getting ahead of myself, okay? But let's read, okay? For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay? The wages of sin is death. Now you can make a very valid argument, I guess, 
uh, if you want to, uh, about, well, what is Paul actually talking about, okay? We're all going to die, thanks to, you know, Adam and Eve, obviously, okay? Everybody dies. Everybody's going to die, okay? All right? We are born sinners. And until you are at that age of accountability, and no, it doesn't say age of accountability, but there will come a time when a kid will understand that he has sinned against God, okay? And they will come, there will come a time when they will be able to comprehend what that means. Hence, it's like, well, I didn't know. Oh, no, 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 Dang. Or else there'd be kind of all kinds of innocent people in hell, right? Right. Okay? Now, let's skip to verses 45 on to verse 49. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit, making alive. Okay? Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. Yes. The second man is the Lord from heaven. See, and this is a big thing that the fake gracers like to avoid. There has to be a death to yourself. Okay? Physical death? You have to die to your self-righteousness. Okay? But see, this concept of dying first in order to be born again. Okay? As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. Oh, wait. Did I skip one? Yes. Let's go to, back to verse 46. Howbeit that which that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and after that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Verse 49, what are we for, right here? And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Okay? And now, look back here while we're in 1 Corinthians, verses 29 on to verse 32. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Christ is alive. Is Jesus Christ walking around physically on the earth today? No. No. His body, we are, but he, is he himself in his physical body? No. If he were, then the unpardonable sin would be viable. Okay? But he isn't. Okay? He was before the death, burial, and resurrection. He will be again during the kingdom of heaven. Okay? All right? But he's alive. Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? Jesus Christ is. He is. He's alive. That's what you say of an eternal being. Okay? He is. All right? Is Jesus dead? No, he's alive. Obviously, he's God the Father. Okay? All right? Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. The reality is, friends, Every day that you progress in age, no matter what this stupid, uh, brilliant evolutionist wants you to believe, physically, every day, you die a little. And what Paul is talking about, I die daily, verse 32. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, natural, brute, 
beasts, unregenerate, not saved people, like the majority, like virtually all the free gracers, okay? Like the majority, if not all, Christians, okay? All right? Beasts, natural, brute beasts. Is he talking about lions and tigers and bears? You can make an argument, I guess, if you want, but that's not what he's talking about. He's referring on to what? If after the manner of men, <laughs> it's right there, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Oh, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And see, that's another thing about the free gracers, because they use their satanic theology to justify you eating and drinking for tomorrow you die. But hey, don't worry, you just save yourself by your own belief. So don't worry about it. Okay? Just got to get those, those guys are disgusting. Just got to get the pot shots in there while I can, okay? But die daily. Every day you age in progression, your body dies. Okay, thermodynamics, people. Okay, and it's not like what these woo -hoo -hoo evolutionists tell you. Okay. You know, in actuality, what, what's, the, what the, what's the combat to that? Well, wine gets better with age. Wine, it degrades with age, making it more potent and more flavorful. But the reality is what happens to that wine is it degrades, making it more tasty, more flavorful, and in more cases than not, more alcoholic. Okay? The natural thing of breaking down. Things break down in time. Wine is not the exception to the rule. Uh, even with the Jesuit priest, with the abracadabra, hocus pocus, woody woody. <coughs> okay? We die daily. Die to ourselves to that. Die to ourselves that we may live unto Christ. Okay? All right? See, you, you, we could, we could be here for a uh, 10 part three hour at a time video where we, if we want to nitpick what is, what kind of death dying is being referred to, okay? What we need to understand is, what is the opposite of to die? It is to live, okay? But see, Christ says, you know, uh, he who uh, loves his soul will lose it or whatever he says, I just butchered that. We are to die daily to this, which brings us life. Okay? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay? And see, we, the saint who die to ourselves daily, Christ, the quickening spirit, makes us alive in him. That's how that works. Okay? All right? Now, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and verse 14. Here, Paul is describing this very well. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The free gracer says yes. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized unto Jesus Christ, into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Baptized is not, is referring on to identify. Obviously. Look at the verse. Okay? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the 
body of sin, the sin suit, might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve, make the choice to, sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Hmm? What is the opposite of dead? To be alive. We are dead to sin, hence we're alive in Christ. See? For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin, Catholic, once. Not every day, a hundred thousand times a day, in every single one of your disgusting little phallus houses, okay? For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Our death, you know, at the death of the cross, but we die daily to ourselves that we may live unto God, who quickens our mortal bodies. You see how that works? Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, and it answers itself right away, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is the opposite of being dead? Being alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord, who dwells within the saint. Let not sin therefore reign, R-E-I-G-N, in your mortal body, control you. Okay? You're the one who ultimately pulls the trigger. Okay? Okay, because God nor Satan forces you to do anything. Okay? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye, plural, should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members, plural. Get your head out the gutter. Members, hands, fingers, arms, legs, feet, okay? Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. He's referring to the Old Testament law that no one could keep. We are under the law to Christ. Okay. All right. We're not walking around lawless. The law that we, are, we have for us today is given to us specifically doctrinally for us within the Pauline epistles. Okay. All right. Verse, I know the verse 14. Let's read uh, verses 15 and 16. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Free gracer says yes. God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Okay? All right. And now let's skip a little. Let's read the whole thing. But God be thanked that ye were servants to sin, not slaves. God's not holding a gun at your head, neither is Satan. Okay? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Flesh. Sinsu. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness to, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, 
You were free from righteousness. You didn't know what it was. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. What kind of death? Spiritual? Or physical? Or maybe even both? See, the more you continue in your sin, the more you're going to die spiritually. And, you know, for example, you're getting drunk every, every day. Okay? Scripture says don't get drunk with wine. You can drink wine. Yes, you can. It says don't get drunk. You're getting drunk every day. You're dying, you know. The more you continue in the sin, the more easier it becomes to justify it. The more you die spiritually. And also the more your body is dying because of thermodynamics, you are dying physically as well. You're deciding to go sow your royal oats around, right? You catch an STD, died spiritually, but also you're going to die physically. Okay? All right? But now be made free from sin and become the servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, physical and spiritual. But the gift of God is eternal life, obviously, through Jesus Christ our Lord. I think you can rightly encompass both. Because the more you continue in the sin, smoking a cigarette, that's a sin. People justify it. Okay, you're dying gradually and your chances of dying are increasing more and more. You drink alcohol every day and getting drunk every day. Your body is deteriorating because of it and you're in sin and it's becoming easier. The more you're looking at pornography, okay, it, you're justifying it more. It becomes easier and plus your body is dying anyway and it could lead you on to doing something really stupid. Get an STD, you, you follow this along. How far do you want to go with that? Okay? All right? All right? And also, too, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 1 and 3. Excuse me. Ephesians 2, 1 and 3. Lost people. And you, saved person, hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Quick and made alive. Dead. What is the opposite of being dead? Alive. Okay? What's the opposite of to die? To live. Okay? You're not saved, Christian. You're not saved, obvious. Free gracer. What are you? You're dead in trespasses and sins. I was once lost. The Lord saved me 16 years ago. I was dead in trespasses and sin. The guy we talked about on Monday, look at his eyes. That guy's dead in trespasses and sin. He's not saved. Okay? Where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, nature, natural brute beasts, nature, children of wrath, even as others. You're not saved. You reject the gospel, you're a child of wrath. You're a natural brute. You're not a regenerate, saved individual. God's wrath is for you. Uh, hey, genius, guess what? Wrath is not love. Okay? Boop. <laughs> that, that ought to be obvious. Okay? Okay? All right? Now, granted, this is all after the Garden of Eden. Yes. Yes, you're all right. 
But see, it's important that we establish these things before we get to it. Okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Verse says, 4 on to verse 6. Okay? Who in any connotation whatsoever, who, man brought death into the world. But we see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, who was the first one to mention it? Okay? Was he referring to a spiritual death that would lead onto a physical? Obviously, yes. But regardless, the idea that something would be the opposite of living to die was given of God and man was aware of at least that concept. How could he not? How could he not? Okay? Please ask these nine. And, uh, seriously. How could, how could man, when God was the one who first mentioned that, how could man be oblivious of the concept of the opposite of living, which is to not live, to die? How? When God, was the first, when God was the one who brought it into the equation and mentioned it. And that's what Satan worked off of in the wrong order. I'm getting ahead of myself. Ecclesiastes 9 verses 4 and verse 6. For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Dog who returns to his vomit. The, you know, a dead lion walking about as, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. For the living know that they shall die. Did they in the Garden of Eden know that they were going to die? They were aware that there was a possibility of that. You, that you, can't, there, you can't deny that, man. You can't. You can't. When God was, well, we're going to look at that again. When God was the one who was the very first one to mention the word die in any connotation in Scripture, that was the first time, okay? That was the first time God was the one who brought it up. So man, were they ignorant of the spiritual death? I believe so, and we'll look at that. But they were not ignorant of, of the concept of the opposite of living, which is to die. They, they could not have been. They could not have been when the Lord was the one who brought it up. Could they have mused? Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Sure. But the, the concept alone of the opposite of living, which is to die, was brought up to them by the Father. That is undeniable. You can't deny that. So, were, were they aware of whether spiritual or physical, which is the basis of the question, the idea, at least, of the opposite of being alive, which is to be dead, to die, was there because of God. Man was the one who brought death into the world. Don't twist what I said, you wicked devils. Okay? We looked at it in Scripture. Okay? And hence, it also plays more to, it was a work. Okay? It was a work in the Garden of Eden. You do that, you're going to die. Well, what kind of death? And see, and well, let's finish this. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, and that could be a twofold. When you're dead, you're dead. Okay, you're dead. But those who are dead in trespasses and sins? Well, let's keep reading. What is being talked about? Let's read. But the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the, mem for the memory of them is forgotten. He's obviously referring onto a physical death here in this context. Verse 6. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So verse 5, the dead and die and dead, what kind of de death is he talking about? Obviously, the physical, okay? Obviously, that's what he's talking about. Context, you can't get away from that. You can't. I mean, I, I mean, you go ahead and try if you want to, but between four and six, it's pretty plain, okay? 
And also in Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 on to verse 28. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer, offer himself often, like every day in a Roman Catholic church, when you got the satanic devil, Roman Catholic, Jesuit priest, taking the sun cookie, the bale cookie, raising the dead like that, abracadabra, hocus pocus, woody, woody, woody. Okay? You're deceived, Catholic. And like I told the one in the one comment, I ain't got time for your stupidity. Okay? You're going to come on <laughs> There's nothing worse than a Catholic who thinks they know something about Scripture. They are, that's dangerous. Okay, but anyway. <clears throat> not, that, not yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this to judgment. What kind of, what, what is that talking about? Physical, physical death. Okay. Physical death. Okay. You can get cute and say, well, Moses is going to die a second time. You're right. You're right. And Elijah is finally going to die. You're right. Talking about the two witnesses, okay? If you really want to be cute and go that way, but the scripture stands. We're all going to die physically once. Moses is... Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. So Christ was once offered to bear the sin of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Okay? Now go back to Genesis. How do we know that it was the physical death and not the spiritual? Again, Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 on to verse 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge, brain, knowing, of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. The opposite of die is to live. Okay? Dad, come on. All right? Again, this concept of the opposite of living to die <laughs> but what what was it? I believe right there, yes. Knowledge, ye shall be as gods. Knowledge, spiritual. Amen. I'm with you. Amen. Now, now, they have God said. Now the serpent, Satan was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Did God say that? Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman, <laughs> Eve, didn't go to Adam. Where was Adam? Why wasn't Eve by Adam? Valid question. Regardless, he went to the woman, the woman who was made for man, the weaker vessel. Sister, you got a problem with what I just said? You take it up with the father, not with me. Woman, girl, feminazi, you got a problem with the fact that you were made for man and not man for you? You, you, you take it up with the father, the Lord Jesus Christ, woman. Not with me. Not with me. Okay? 
Take it up with him. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit, now pay attention, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, that he said, neither shall ye touch it. He did not say, find it, in Genesis chapter 2, lest ye die. I, I agree. I believe that in verse 17, the Lord was referencing on first the spiritual death because the knowledge, knowledge, they didn't know what sin was. But this concept of the opposite of living, which is to die, was there. You cannot get away from that. You can't. You can't get away from that. The thought of the opposite of living to die was there because the Lord said, Yes, I agree. That was he referring first onto the spiritual? Yes. But what happened with the spiritual led onto the physical? But look at what Satan is doing now. To be anti is to be against and to replace. And what does he say? Yea, hath God said. Okay? And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Question. What did Satan mean there? He was talking about the physical. Okay? Because they didn't know what sin was, but yet they had the premise to know the opposite of living is to die. Okay? They knew of that at least. How can they not with verse 17 in Genesis 2? How could they not? And that's what Satan was going off of. Prove it to you. Let's keep reading. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. What was Satan offering him? Offering her. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, disobey what God said, do it your own way. Okay? Then your eyes shall be open. Come on. Were they, were, could she see, could she see physically? Yes, your eyes will be open. What was Satan offering? A spiritual thing. He was basing the temptation with the idea of the physical death when offering the exact thing that God said not to do, spiritual death. Do you see? That's what was going on. That's how we know that when it comes to this context, that Satan was making a reference onto the physical death. Because what was he offering? Spiritual death in the disguise of, oh, you're not going to physically die? Come on. Okay, let's continue. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He wasn't talking about, in that context, he wasn't talking about the spiritual. Because look at what he did. Verse 5. For God doth know, because hey, God's keeping this from you. He was offering a spiritual death. While basing it off of the physical death. Don't worry, you're not going to physical die, physically die. It was the physical death, brother. Look at it. Look at it. Okay? For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, God's keeping this from you. He doesn't want you to be like him. Offering the spiritual death. Okay? While saying, this, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You shouldn't do that. But hey, you just believe and receive. Just go ahead. Have a little. Don't worry about it. You're not going to die. It was the physical death right there in Genesis 3 that Satan was working off of while offering. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, they could physically see, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. 
He was Satan was offering the spiritual death that the Lord, yes, warned about. But he got through to Eve by pacifying. Don't worry, you're not going to physically die. They were aware of the opposite of what it is to live by the Lord himself. Okay? And continuing. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Yes. Yes. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. The, the shame of their nakedness before they were standing before the Lord bare butt naked, okay? With no shame. They did contrary and they died spiritually. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. That, you can't deny that. But the question was, how do you know that it was a spiritual death that Satan was talking about? That was uh, um, uh, because it doesn't say that, but it does. Oh, hold on one second. Let me, let me read the quote verbatim. All right, here's the question. Quote, Why would Adam or Eve, either one, have thought of physical death? They would have had no idea what it was, what that was. No one had ever died. That is true. But then again, as we see, the, op, the concept of the opposite of living, which is to die, was brought up by the Lord. How does anyone know that that is what they were thinking of. Where is that stated? Well, look at what Satan was doing. Satan went off of the premise of a physical death. They were aware of death, at least in the opposite to be alive, brother. And they were in verse 17. And the Lord was the one who brought that up. It can be presumed the spiritual death which did happen immediately led to the physical death. Yes, it did. Absolutely. Doth the scripture say that God was talking about the physical death? Of course, he would have known that their spiritual death would lead to their physical death. Absolutely. And he was talking about first the, the uh, spiritual death, like you said. Absolutely. How do you know that either one of them were expecting an immediate physical death? By uh, Eve's response. By Eve's response. Because the temptation by Satan was a spiritual one. And once their eyes were open, then they were aware that, oh, they had sinned. See, that's how that works. How do you know that either one of them were expecting an immediate physical death when the word does not say such? You're right, it doesn't say that, but that's what Satan was basing it off of, okay? And when Eve said that, neither shall ye touch it. It's like, don't touch it or you'll die. He never said that. What does it, you're, like, you're right, it could be presumed. And yes, God was talking about a spiritual death. But Satan worked off of the physical while offering the spiritual death. See, that's how that works. How can you know that they were expecting, and perhaps the physical death, which came much later in the result of the spiritual death, which I think we have just explained? They were created in the image and likeness of God. Sin entered in by their choice. Yes, the likeness was taken. God is eternal. God is sinless. Adam and Eve would have been everlasting. Yes, but sin entered in. Yes, I have wondered for quite some time how you can know just exactly what they were expecting when they had no idea of what death was. They did, though, brother, because thou shalt surely die. What is the opposite of to die is to live? The, that concept of not living was already there by God. Okay? That's how. That's how. Yes, he was talking about the spiritual. Yes, he was. I, I'm, we're in agreement. But Satan was working off of the premise of the physical. And the way Eve responded, don't touch it or you're going to die. 
obviously was what? Physical. Physical. Okay? Because he offered the... Because he yeah, had God said. Okay? He had to hide the spiritual by saying, don't worry about the physical. See? See? Okay? Physical death didn't exist yet. You're right. Wait, 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 wait. Did I skip one? I have wondered for, for quite some time how you can know just exactly what they were expecting when they had no idea what death was. They were aware of the concept at the very least. The opposite, I mean, you can't get away from verse 17 in Genesis chapter 2. You can't. And God was the first one to mention it in any connotation, brother. Okay? Uh... Okay, I have wondered for quite some time how you can know just exactly what they were expecting when they had no idea what death was, nor which one they would face. Physical death didn't even exist yet. They had no liking, inkling. Where did God explain to them the difference between a physical death and a spiritual one so that they could understand there were two different deaths and which one they would experience first? Just wondering. Well, experience is the best teacher in some of that, okay? And then, like I said, beautiful question. Beautiful question, which I believe we have, we're answering pretty good. The Lord is answering through the scriptures. Now, let's continue. Verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. They saw God. Okay. Now, had they died physically? No. But they were aware that they were naked. So they died spiritually. Yes, they did. Because they did what God said not to do. Under the guise that they wouldn't die immediately by what Satan said. Okay? And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? God now giving Adam the chance to man up. God knew what happened. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God knew what happened. God was giving Adam the chance to man up to be a man and take accountability for his actions. And he said, Who told thee thou was naked, that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me she did. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. It's her fault. The, Adam, the old man, the Adamic nature. She, I, yeah, I did. You did it first, then she did, and yeah, I messed up. Yeah. How many times do you encounter that one, huh? <laughs> With lost people or false converts. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. The devil made me do it. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The very first prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unto woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. They're mentioning the physical death. Okay? See, they were aware of death. How, could, how, how, how are you going to get away from verse 17? In Genesis chapter 2. 
What's the opposite? What does it mean to die? Not to live. Okay? All right? So it was at least in a form there. Okay? And Eve's reaction in Genesis 3 verse 3 tells us what? You're right. It could be presumed. Okay? But they were aware of some form of death. They could how could they not be when the Lord was the one who brought up the word die first in Scripture in Genesis 2 verse 17? How? So they were aware of it. They were. Which one? Satan based his thing off of the spiritual to, to fool Eve to make the decision to kill themselves spiritually, which led on to the physical. That's how that works. So we know in Genesis 3, they were thinking because of her reaction, don't touch it. Don't touch it. It'll kill you. They weren't thinking of the spiritual. That happened after they disobeyed and their eyes were like, whoa. Oh, hey, baby. Oh, wait, we're naked. Okay. They were, if anything, if anything with what the Lord said in Genesis 2 verse 17, with anything... They weren't aware of any spiritual implication. Why? Because of their reaction. You're right. There was no sin. Man was immortal. You're right. So, but yet God was the one who brought up dying. God was the one who brought it up. They didn't know. Satan's like, hey, hey, hey. He's hiding this from you. Your eyes will be open. Spiritual. They could see, obviously, right? So, Satan based his temptation off of the thought that of physical death, and Eve's response shows us that they were expecting a death of an immediate because, don't touch it! Don't touch it! Ah! Now, is that too far to presume? Maybe. But the idea of a physical death is what Satan based it off of to get them to make the decision to die spiritually first, which led into the physical. So that they were expecting an immediate death. Don't touch it! Don't even touch it! Which he never said. Okay? And yes, in verse 17 in Genesis 2, obviously he was referring on to us the tree of knowledge. Ye shall be as gods, knowing knowledge. Yes, spiritual, which led on to the physical. From dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return. That's how, brother. That's how. That's how and why that I say that I think they were thinking of a, an immediate death. Don't even touch it. Don't even touch it. It'll kill you. Was that in regards to the spiritual? No. They had no idea of anything, any, any spiritual because of the purity. But when they went contrary to what God said, they spiritually died, which will lead to the physical. Yes, you're right. And Adam called his wife wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. Spiritual death. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the end east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So that is why when reading this, especially with verse 3, that is why I believe, obviously, that the death that was being talked about of Satan there was the physical and immediate. Because don't even touch it. She added that as a precursor, as a warning. It's like, don't, don't, you know, don't eat it. Don't even touch it. Because, hey, if I touch it, I might immediately die. And it's like, don't worry about it. You're not going to die immediately. You know? They were immortal. You're right. They didn't even have a thing about dying, you know, for even a long time thing. But, again, 
the concept of not living, which is die, God brought up in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. So, beautiful question, and I do believe, praise our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, that that question has been answered. Any any more questions, brother? Um, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, of course. Any questions? Let's let's go. Let's go. That that great question. I like questions like that. I like questions like that. I like that. I wish more saints would. Ask, I mean, we got the you know the uh, the one brother who asks questions like that. But that that's a great. Que I like questions like that. I like questions like that. A great question. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. That was a great question. And those of you saints who may watch this, hopefully this will help you. Like I said, that, 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 the question was not a novice question. I like that. I like that. So that's going to be it for this video. Going to get this one all uploaded. Thank you for watching this. If you do, we love you. And Lord willing, we will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.